Thank you everybody for coming out. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. And I thank Brother Leon for affording me this opportunity. But I hope this doesn't come off like a little pity party, but it seemed like the last three or four times I've had the honor of standing up here, uh, the Lord will give me a message and somebody else will preach on the same subject. Well, it's happened again. This morning, here, here two or three weeks ago, the Lord just kind of posed a question to me. Can light and darkness exist in the same place? And light being saved, darkness being sin. And what does Sister Sue teach on this morning? Being the light of the world. But what, and I'm going to be honest, I went home today really struggling with this message because, you know, I'm always, what the Lord seems to give me is always on a different view of that same subject. But just then, when during praise and worship, the Lord whispered to me, well, maybe I'm doing that because so the situation or the, so the subject can be clearly explained. Because we need to realize who we are. We need to realize not only that we are the light, but there's darkness in the world. Amen. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, as long as we're bound by this old flesh, if we're not careful, darkness can raise up in us. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a, the question, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, because I'm not good at tiling messages. Can light and darkness dwell in the same place? And of course, the, the, the basic answer is no. Romance or whatever, that's what it's going to say. 
And that's why, as I've shared this before, that's why everybody should invest in a good Bible. Amen. We all want the newest phone. We all want the newest game system for our kids. Spend the money to get a good Bible. Amen. If you truly love the Word, and there's really no excuse now when you get them so free on your phone, but I don't know why this, I'm going to throw this in extra. This has nothing to do with it. And no offense to you, those of you that use your phone for a Bible. I have one of my phones, I use it quite often at work. But I heard of it. A pastor said the other day, he's going to address that issue in his staff meeting. It's fine to have your tablet for your notes, but when you come to the pulpit, have a book. Amen. I don't know why. I just, I will be honest. Yes, I have a few times. Well, no, I, I'll, I'll try to tell a lot. Forgive me, Lord. I have used my phone, but it won't open in here. So Amen. Maybe, maybe, I can't open the app in here. So maybe the Lord's trying to tell me something. But there's just stuff that's not holding the book. Because, yes, okay, thank you, Lord. Another, another thing that doesn't need to be said. Yes, I know y'all are all good Christian folks, and you're not looking at anything else when you use your phone for a nap. But, anywho, let's go on. This is what I said, light and dark. Verse 7 and 8 has nothing to do with light or darkness. Or does it? What is that commandment? What, are the, what is the purpose of the commandment? What is the purpose of God's law? But to show us the right way to live. So we can walk in light. And as Sister Sue pointed out this morning, yes, we are the light of the world. And what's the purpose of that light but to dispel darkness? If we were to turn every light off in here, you know, and everyone's been in the candle at 30. You like that one candle? What leaves? The minute the light comes on, what leaves? Darkness. Darkness. But right now, yes, you can look at certain parts of the room. You look up there on the balcony. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit darker. But still, the light always dispels darkness. They cannot coexist. But in the, in the, in the light of word, and let's look at verse 9. He that saith he is the light, and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto this even until now. Okay, hate is such a strong word, I can I'm quite sure. None of y'all say, well, I don't hate anybody. But the word hate in here it means to test. To test, especially to persecute. So let's look at this from a little softer standpoint. Have you ever heard something especially come from the pulpit that you didn't agree with and got mad at? Got mad at that. And instead of going to that person, so what did you mean by that? You just kind of mumble and complain about it. That's the testing what that person just said. So in essence, when we hear, and I've been guilty of it, I'll be the first one to say it. My first inclination, because I guess I am still in this flesh, my first feeling when I hear something on this I, that I don't really agree with, it's natural to kind of bristle up. But if you truly love your brother, if you're truly walking in the light, you're going to take a step back. Say, man, why did they say that? Did, they, did I really hear what I said? And especially for me, ladies and gentlemen, y'all know me. And I said it because I know I'm going to ruffle your feathers. I don't do it intentionally, but I just know how the Lord deals with me. Sister Sue, I love you dearly. He, he, she said it this morning, so I can repeat it. The Lord deals with her kind of in a goofy manner. Because she's a goofy I love her. She's a goofy person. She is. You go on a youth trip with her, you'll find out just how. And this is a confession hour, so ask her. But anyhow, but the Lord does. She's 100% right. The Lord does deal with the, right where you're at. And for me, I'm not that I'm more serious, but I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up with understanding the Bible. But I did grow up seeing Christians. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Let's talk about dark times. Jackson County. Many churches. Overall, I, I live in Jackson County since 1980. You know, I was never one time invited to church. Not one time. Worked for a deacon in one of the largest churches in Newport. Worked with the, another man that I worked for. He was the deacon of a Pentecostal church. Not one time was I invited to church. But yet, I've seen all these people that I knew were Christians doing this, doing that. But here's the thing, and I said all that to say this. When I go to, and from the beginning, and I've always been able reading, when I go to read the Word, I don't look at it from a Pentecostal perspective. I don't look at it from a Baptist perspective. I look at it as what it is, God's Word. And I try to understand it. I try to get the understanding. 
heard Sister Karen say one time that she liked to get a mental picture when she dreams something. I guess I might have a questioning nature. I was like, what does he really mean? And the verse that really ignited my desire to understand this word beyond just reading it is what I read. Because all I had, I don't even know where it comes from, just a little cheap King James Bible. didn't have any footnotes, no commentary, nothing like that. And remember, I don't never been to church. Didn't know anything about it. Knew all about God. And I read the verse, if you don't hate your mother or your brother, you can't be a father of mine. Believe it somewhere. And look, I said, wait a minute. You mean this? And, and I hear I'm a new Christian. 39 years old. So wait a minute. God cannot mean that we have to hate our family in order to be his follower. So what did I do? Did I just, oh, I'm not going to serve someone who wants me to hate my family and throw my hands up. i got to find out what that means. That word hate cannot, that scripture cannot mean hate. And of course, we all know this. That's just a very poor, and forgive me, and I do read from the King James Bible, forgive me, but that was just a poor translation of the King James Bible. We all know that word hate should mean love less. And once I realized that, it made sense. Because here we are, God. Are we, are we going to be the light of this world and love our family more than we love the God that created us? That's why I hate to say that's where most of the church is. Right. Let's be real. That's where most of the church is. Because the minute you get your feathers all ruffled, right. and you go to, if you take that, if, if I say something that offends you, and you take that to anybody but the Lord, guess what you've just done? You've talked against a brother. Amen. Right. Guess what you've just done? You allowed hate into your heart. That's right. And we've all done it, if we'll be honest. Amen. Amen. So it is vital that we understand that we are the light of the world, but that light and darkness will not coexist. But unfortunately, we are bound of this flesh. Just because Christ died for us, and everything we need was provided at that moment of his death. When he said it was finished, it was finished. Mm -hmm. We're still in this flesh. And guess what? We can turn that light switch off. We can allow darkness to come in. Mm -hmm. As I heard one preacher say, he said it really, before he got saved, he was, he had a really bad temper. And for a long time, I let that, it was almost like I was dragging a coffin around. Anytime anybody would say something to offend me, I would grip up, well, wait a minute. I can't say that. But this old man that used to be, when he can't, I'd let him come out. Is that ever been any of us? Amen. With that person, when we lose our temper, when we lose our temper, are we lost? Does that mean our, our name is erased from the last book of life? No. But we've allowed darkness in. So when darkness comes in, as I said a while ago, when you turn the lights on, what leaves? Darkness. And you allow darkness in, what leaves? The light. So the minute you allow that darkness in, for that brief second, hopefully, hopefully it's just a brief second. But what about me? You, you just keep thinking, I just can't let that go. Well, I heard that next thing. You just start, you just dwell. And guess what it does? It's just like a sore. Sometimes a little sore on your hand, you can just ignore it to go away. Sometimes you need to put a bandage on it, it'll heal up. Sometimes it gets a little infected, you need to put a little, you got to treat it a little better. That's the way when we let hurt feelings or especially sin is, if we don't treat it at its source, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Amen. And if you're like me, you know, as my daddy used to tell me, he said, boy, you just can't let that bum go. You're worse than a dog chewing on a bone. I just, when I got something in my mind, it's hard for me to let it go, isn't it, Diane? <laughs> I just go on and on like I'm doing right now. So, yes, it's possible to have both light and darkness because we're mortal. That's why we have to understand what it means to be the light of the world. And of course, like, let's go on with verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Put that pure Arkansas English. Verse 10, let me put what this says to me, when I love my brother, when I truly love my brother, I'm going to make sure I don't do anything to cause him to stumble. Amen. Right. There you go. If I truly love you, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to catch myself. And yes, there's many times I've said it, and it's, it's not a joke, it's not a cliche. There's times I have to bite my old tongue to shut John up. <coughs> because John likes to say it. 
John likes to speak his mind, and trust me, my mind's getting to the point where I don't need to lose a piece of it. I don't need to give anybody a piece of my mind. But that is my nature. That's what John wants to do. But luckily, there's one dwelling in John that's smarter than John, and I've learned and trained myself to listen to him more than I listen to John. Yes, I talk to myself. I answer myself. I argue with myself. Because if I don't, I'm not exaggerating, ladies and gentlemen, because I know, John, if I don't, guess what? The wrong force is going to win. But luckily, I have learned to listen to that, as we talked about here several times, that still small voice. I wish the Lord would grab me by the neck, the neck and shake me sometimes. That's not the way he works. What glory would it be, what glory would he get if he had to force us to do everything? That's a taskmaster. That's not a God. But when he can just whisper, God, this was really hard. John, you were wrong. You need to apologize. You know why it's so hard to apologize, ladies and gentlemen? Let me tell you what an apology is. It's an admission of guilt. Yep. If you truly have to apologize for something, what you're doing is saying, I was wrong. I did something wrong. That's why it's hard to apologize. But the child of God, and we've all been there, we'll even apologize for things we didn't do just to make peace. Yes. Yes. Just to show that love. Yes. Karen, don't look at John when I say that. <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, when you truly love, especially if you have the, the bad habit or the, 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 the wrong temperament, and you are a little bit judgmental. And, and, and I don't like that word. When we say that's what's wrong with the church, that's the reason there's so much darkness in the church, we have taken a biblical phrase, judge not lest ye be judged. What does a judge do? A judge weighs the evidence. He listens to both sides, and he puts the verdict out. Unless you say, you're going to hell if you keep doing that, and, and you can't back it up with this, then you judge. But if you point out fault, which we should do, and act, where should correction start? I hear them work. Lost people are supposed to do stupid things. Lost people are supposed to sin. Correction begins in the house of the Lord, and that's what's wrong. No one wants to hear correction anymore. You're judging me. What kind of light do you have in you if that's your first response when someone comes to you in love and says, Brother, you're a little bit in the air up here. And if your first response is, it's not your place to judge me. Right. Is there truly light dwelling in you? No. Or is that darkness? No. Yes, there is light dwelling in you. That boy can make anything. You come in a bad mood and watch that young man be in a good mood. But let's get real, church. We are the light of the world. Once we accept Christ and our name is written in the last book of life, we become a light. Because we're, what is the, what's the purpose of life? To help you find your way. Is that what we really do? Or do we want to tell people, and I don't want to completely off this message, but i got to say this. Why is the church do so empty? My whole life, you know, I kept me from church for years. Well, when I stopped this, I found that. I can't, and I even told the Lord. The Lord was dealing with my heart a little bit before I got saved. And I said, Lord, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready to go to church. I'm not going to go to church doing what I do. Because that was my, where did that mindset come from, ladies and gentlemen? Let's get real. Where did the mindset that I can't go to church if I'm this? I can't go to church because I do that. Where did that mindset come from? The law? The devil? So it comes from the church. We are so good at telling people what they shouldn't do and what we can't do. That's what the world thinks. I'm going to be honest. I didn't have to give up a thing when I got saved. I still went forward on Saturday because I already quit drinking. Didn't even know why. The Lord was preparing me. But I would love to walk in this church every service and, and it reek of alcohol. Yes, come on. And I witnessed this in, in, the, in the church. Well, not the church I got saved, but I got saved at home. It's the first church I was a member of. This man come in, it was obvious. I mean, he was dirty, nasty, smelled of alcohol. I saw 10 people walk by him. Not one person greeted him. I went and messed with him sitting next to him. I'm not saying that to glorify myself. 
I think that's what we should do. Yes. And I think that's what would happen here. But really, in fairness, would it? Come on. Really, in fairness, if we'll be honest with ourselves, do we really want to associate with that type of people? Because I think that the scripture said we should even hate the garment of those that sin. And we should. But we are so quick to embrace some things, so quick to reject other things. Are we truly letting the light shine? Are we letting our what we want people to do? What it, even not want, you know, but my nose up is not going anywhere. But I am going to go one other place on it. But let's get real. What does it really look like? Let's get on an individual personal basis. I want each, as I read this next scripture, I want each and every person to think of themselves. Are we truly wanting light to shine for the sole purpose of leading people out of darkness or to make show people what we are? Come on. Are we really correcting people in, in, when they have a wrongful lifestyle to help them get out of it? Or are we wanting to show them what we've got out of it? That's like testimony service. A, a true godly testimony is like Y'all never heard me share my testimony here. And I won't let the Lord tell them to. But your testimony should not be about the sin and the wrong you did. It should be about giving glory for, to God for who you are now. Amen. But all too often, we hear, I've heard testimony after testimony. It's just it's almost like a glorifying the sin. Right. Because there's that aspect of my testimony I don't want people to know. But it's not pleasant. Actually, my wife, Sister Karen, is the only one that's ever heard my full testimony. Because there's, because when I think, and I, I don't know, I feel like I'm saying this for somebody, when I think about my past, it's so easy to think about the darkness. When I think about some of the things I went through, darkness seems to come out more than light. So I don't want to. I'm not going to dwell on it. And I only share it when I feel that there's somebody that needs to hear it. I know maybe I'm off track here, but what is truly being the light of the world? But once again, pointing people. When you turn the light on, when you go into your any room, you turn the light on, what reason? To find out where you're going. That's what our life should be, pointing people to where we want them to go, Amen. not pointing out what they're doing wrong. Amen. They probably already know what they're doing wrong. Yes, amen. Amen. But so how do we truly live our life? Well, what? This is one of my favorite verses, very familiar. But this, to me, is what being light and darkness truly is. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Before you ever turn there, most of you could quote it. This is truly my favorite verse. But this week I heard something. I've never thought about this standpoint. First Corinthians, second Corinthians, I'm sorry, second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yes. New. God is not in. Does not give second chances. God does not just give second chances. God's not in the restoration business because if you just because you give someone a second chance. Is there any guarantee they're going to succeed? No. When you restore something, it's still the same thing. See, when I got saved, I didn't just lose a bunch of bad habits. My spirit and my soul became completely new. That means I have no desire. I was talking to a young lady the other day. She asked me to pray for her mother. And I'm sorry I forgot to say that during her mother just today had to, yesterday had to have a quadruple bypass. And she's a believer, and she said, you know, I don't really, I'm asking you to pray because I find it hard to pray. And we talked, you know, other stuff. And she said, because, you know, I used to be real, I was a bad drug addict, but I was giving up drugs, and, you know, I don't struggle with it. Think about it. That point, that, when she, I said, that, I said, that shows you've accepted deliverance. If you still struggle with it, then what does it mean to struggle with something? That means you hold it on to it. You push it, it pushes you. If you've truly been delivered, and you're still, no, let me rephrase that. If you've asked the Lord to deliver you from anything, whether it be gossiping, lying, smoking, drugs, whatever it is, if you've asked the Lord to free
free you from it, and you claim that he has, and you're still struggling with it, guess what's happened? You yeah. haven't let go of it. Come on. Yeah. Doesn't the, our Bible teach us, isn't one of the basic truths of prayer is when you're right with God, God will use the desire of your heart. You can say all day long, I need to quit smoking. But I don't want to. Lord, help me quit. I've even seen people come up and have their tongues anointed with oil. I'm sorry, that's stupid. <laughs> but what do they do? They went right out and had a cigarette right out. Yeah. Why is God going to take something from you you want? Amen. Come on. God's not in the taking business. Yeah, I know the songs have something that's beautiful. He does, but he is in the receiving business. God will not just forcefully reach out and you and take a bad habit out. You have to give it to him. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But I truly believe if God was a force, had to forcefully take it from you, would he be the loving, would he not be overriding our free will? So think about it before you ask for something. Do you really want to get rid of it? Because need isn't a good reason. You can need to all day long. Like, I need to die and lose weight. But I don't want to die. I'm not going to die. Yeah. Die and die with a cross behind you. But the point is this. You've got to choose what you want to be. Come on. And if you are truly the light of the world and want to dispel a darkness, leave the light switch on. What is the purpose of light? but to point to something, to help you get to where you're going. That's the only reason we have lights in our house. And I'm so, there's the only room in our house that doesn't have a light source. Is the two bedroom we don't use. The kitchen, got an illuminated clock on the microwave, got an illuminated clock on the stove. The living room, there's a little light on the TV all the time. In the room, the computer, blue light always on. We keep a night light in the bathroom. It's not that we're afraid of the dark. We want to see where we're going. Amen. So are we really the light of the world? Do we keep that light on so we can point people? And you don't have to shy at the face. I'm going to be honest. I intended to deny it. I was going to, with it being dark, I, I got a really bright, I was going to turn all the lights off and shine that light at everybody and dispel that darkness. I got to think about that sounds kind of corny. But that's why we use light. We want light to show and help us get to where we're going. And that's the purpose of being the light of the world. But if you allow things into your life, you know, every time I hear that song, you slide it under a bush, we'll know, yeah, we do. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? And I'm way off this message, but this fits. Yeah, each and every one of us puts our light under a bushel of some kind. It may be a bushel of grief. It may be a bushel of doubt. It may be a bushel of wine. Really I, I don't know the Bible well enough. I, I would witness to somebody, but, but I don't know the Bible well enough. But do you have the Holy Spirit? Right. You have the offer. Are you saved? Do you have the offer of the Bible in your heart? And did not Jesus tell his disciples, take no thought to what you're going to say? We need to stop trying to witness. We need to stop trying to get the church full and start trusting that God will. Amen. Yes. As long as, well, think about it. As long as we're trying, what are we really doing if we're trying to do something? We're trying. We're doing something. Well, maybe if we would stop trying, just like on the thought of revival. I love what Brother L.J. said to Brother John. I love what he said this morning. Not everybody needs revival. Because to say you need revival is that you need revival. What if, you only need revival if you're dead. So, and also, another thought, do we really want more people in the church? Because as my first pastor said, he said, John, you've got to understand, more people need more problems. Do we really, do we really want, so do we really want revival? Or do we, and think about it, why do we want revival? Do we want revival for revival's sake and we can have a hooping? Shouting good time, go home feeling good about ourselves? Or do we want revival to see people saved from the yes. kingdom of darkness yes. and translated into the kingdom of light? Do we want revival so we can improve family lives? Or do we want revival to come to Jesus Lord Family Worship Center so we can, woohoo, look what we've done. Look what's happened over here at Jesus Lord Family Worship Center. Why do you want revival? Why do you want
want to be the light of the world? Do you want to be that big spotlight that they have with the, the war shows that you point out all the wrong? Or do you want to be that small light that just shines to people under your Don't matter. I, I want to be whatever the Lord wants me to be. It may be a little pin light. But I hope and I do my best to live my life in such a way that there can, someone does see something different in me. It may be only a pinprick of light, but maybe that little pinprick of light is enough to get you to that door. You know, mm -hmm. since we talk about that mask. No, Sister Sue, I don't want to be a mask. Yeah, a mask may light a big fire, but it burns out. It's no yeah. good. Another little corny thought, I'm going to close you with this. In regards to light, you know, one another reason we like light is the heat. What do you want, in regards to revival, do we want to be a thermostat of revival or a thermometer? Most of us, to be honest, we just want to be a thermometer. You know the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat is? A thermometer just says what the temperature is. A thermometer Christian just points out what's going on. Well, you're not doing this. You should be doing this. Oh, I saw what you did. I thought where your car was parked. But a thermostat, you, it changes the temperature. Yes. It lowers it or raises it. If it's too hot, it'll make it too cool. You can cool it down. But what do you want to be, church? Do you want to be a thermostat or a thermometer? Do you want to just read and point out what's going on? Or do you want to be an instrument of change? That's what being the light of the world is, is a true instrument of change. When people can see, like when they, someone, when they see me, when people that know Ed Mahan, the way he used to be, they can see him now living with the Lord, that's life that changes things. Mm -hmm. But if you're the same old thing you've been, well, you know, yeah, I know. I know old John's going to church now. Boy, he sure has a hard time controlling his mouth. He sure got a bad temper. He sure is this or he sure is that. What kind of light is that? The wrong kind of light. You, we have to let people see the positive. And it has, it has to be done in such a way that you don't know you're doing it. A true Christian light shines without any effort of your own. If you are truly saved, you're truly filled with the Holy Spirit, it's going to be seen just like Sister Sue said this morning. There's something different about him. The greatest compliment I've, been, I've received since I've worked at Bad Boy Transportation, you know, me and this guy were talking, I said, well, I, I do my best to live a Christian life. And I never said about going to church. He said, you know, I can see that. And that young lady, she didn't know, she said, I never said anything about being a minister at work. She said, aren't you a Christian? But aren't you a preacher? I said, yeah, I am. She needed that. So I'm not saying that to make myself look good or pat myself on the back, but that's the way we should be. It's easy to quote scripture. It's easy to tell somebody what the Bible says, if you know it. But what really makes an impact is when they see the Bible. Absolutely. That is true life. That's, right. that's all I have.